Thank you, Mr. Williams, and the floor is now open for questions from the media. Thank you very much, Mr. Ben Baptist. Good morning, Joseph Thomas here. Mr. Williams, you were the last person at the podium. You will be the first person to answer um, a couple of questions from yours truly. And I am particularly interested in the the work which has been collaborated between yourself and the Caribbean Development Bank in terms of um, getting your com comprehensive rehabilitation effort going. Um, you did mention that all efforts will be uh, maintained in trying to build back better and stronger. A timeline, sir, do, do we have, because I understand there's a survey or uh, some consultancy, some level of collaboration going on right now. Um, can you give us some timeline as to when you expect these studies and surveys to be completed? And of course, works to be started. Okay. Um, as I mentioned before, um, that process had started after Tropical Storm Erica. Um, the terms of reference were already completed, and we expected that um, the, the, the consultancy itself would take a period of about six months. So now that I don't have all the details yet because this information just came through that they are now going to try to use a consultant from a previous on, ongoing study. Um, so we expect that um, because that procurement um, process has now been shortened, um, if works for instance, to start by some, somewhere this month for early January, then again we're looking at somewhere um, by about June. That's basically a prelim preliminary timeline for when that study would be undertaken. Mention was also made of the current access that you have to your systems. Um, you, of course, experience difficulty because there was no access and so on. Um, are, we, are we clear on that for now? Um, do you have a lot more access, or do you have total access to all your systems and and what have you? Um, you know, are we clear on this? Um, well, we have now restored access to all the sites that we're working on rehabilitating. Um, there's just, I think I mentioned in the previous briefing, an example is one of the systems like. Bistri, where we spent about over a million dollars to restore access after Erica and restore pipelines, and then that was completely washed away. And this, uh, this is one of the areas where we are, are looking at an alternative to supply. So in areas like this, we did not focus on trying to restore access because we're looking at going a totally different direction. But for the areas where we, um, we plan to do restoration works to restore water by the end of the year, then we have been able to restore access to all these sites. The whole question of, um, let me see if I get it right here now, the, the whole question of um, what you'll be doing regards to your energy supplies and energy sources. Um, you, you made mention, if my memory serves me right, of um, solar and, and what have you. And um, how, how, is that, how is that expected to impact uh, because there is no talk of geothermal energy and you know that sort of thing. How how are we expected to have this great impact on what is it you intend to do? Um, well, as I mentioned, um, the a lot of these measures will be as as backups. Um, but in the case um, where we do, well, let me just first of all say that the intention would be to. Yeah utilize these um, solar, solar systems. And if geothermal comes through, it, it means that, well, we expect that the, the price, well, sorry, when it comes through, we expect the price of, of, of power um, to go down, which would make our operations uh, more affordable. But the intention is that if we can still install the systems, as long as we, we get the money to do that, Initial capital, those initial capital works. Then we have almost zero maintenance costs. So it will be our preference in those areas to to use that. Um, but I mentioned we will still have um, backup, let's say generators, 
in the event that those fail or those can be used. So with regards to geothermal over the, the fossil that's presently used, the main impact will be when we do choose to use power from the grid, we just expect it to be cheaper. But the, the main focus would be as long as the monies can be available to do that initial investment, then we go and we install renewable energy options um, for our, our pumping, system, pumping stations. Okay, just to further reemphasize and to strengthen some of the points that Mr. Williams made in relation to the question asked by Mr. Thomas. Of course, the whole question of the arrangement of increasing the resilience of the water system through the initial initiative we have with CDB. We started off by seeking to improve the quality of the water service in water area one, which is the main water area of the country, stretching from all the way from Hillsborough to Castle Comfort. So of course the municipality of Roseau would be a part and parcel of that. And that was to ensure that we would have increased this performance standard at Dower School by ensuring that there would be less unscheduled interruption. So the one of the first thing was to ensure that we upgrade the network by ensuring that there will be greater quality of the water, as, as we would say, less turbidity of the, of, of the water system. Of course, during that time, we had the advent of Erica. And so right in mid of implementation of the project, we saw the need to go further to augment the reliability and robustness of the system. And so as we speak, we have tangible proof on the ground that some of the resilient measures that we took during that period, which had a further serious impact on the cost of the project um, to the tune of almost $29 million. What we did was to ensure in the water area one, the main catchment area at the intake is that of Antrim. Now Antrim, over the last few years, we had serious incidents of landslide, happening in the vicinity of the upstream side of that intake. And what you find was a lot of the sediments would get into the intake system, and then that was would have to shut down the system without, within the slightest show of rain that you had. So the decision was made to shift that intake upstream, meaning that you put it in a safe zone that you wouldn't have the incidence of slides, and then you would lessen the impact of siltation. Um, so that was done. But that was prior to Maria. We, if we all go up to the Cochrane area now, you'll see the scars still very tangible and visible on the mountainside. Nevertheless, we also took the opportunity to increase our storage capacity. And so the storage capacity in Antrim area was increased by about a quarter million gallons, which is 250,000 gallons. So it means, therefore, we we have to shut down the system, you had more water in supply, in storage that you could supply to the people. Those measures are already in place. The other thing as well, we have to see, as was said earlier on, the access to the site has to be by road communication. And so we took the initiative as well, as part of the resilience improvement coming from Erica, to increase and improve the drainage systems on the road. Added to that as well, we had to increase the slope stability. And if you go today, in the heights of Cochrane, where the new intake is being built, you will see the road is very motorable. And the scars and the impact on the road was very minimal as a result of the improvement that we made. So those are already tangible real realization and manifestation based on this initiative. Um, I think it is very important to say as well, we realize that most of the areas that we have to run the transmission lines have to be through the, the channel or waterway. We also took the initiative to ensure that the routes for the transmission line were within more secured area. So you had less interruption from the whole question of landslide and washout of the pipelines. So Mr. Jyoti, that, or Mr. Joseph Thomas, sorry, those are very tangible actions that we've already taken and we can ensure that we will learn from those going forward. As, re as it regards to renewable energy, of course, prior to the PM or the Prime Minister, or the Honourable Prime Minister, 
making the bold pronouncement of we being the first state to be one of a climate resilient country. We knew during our era of pursuing very vigorously our geothermal pursuit that we said we were going to be one of the first countries in the world to be totally carbon free, meaning that we'll have a, almost a zero carbon footprint. We could well understand the intrinsic um, con connection in climate resilience and renewable energy. By we go in with more, of rene more suited renewable energy, it means therefore we'll be lowering our consumption of fossil fuel and of course lowering our carbon footprint. And by so doing, we will be enhancing our climate resilience because we will no longer be contributing so heavily to the whole question of the carbon generation um, undertakings. That is very important as well. In terms of renewable energy, Mr. Williams mentioned lower op operating costs. But even prior to the lower operating costs, we have to take into consideration the whole question of reliability. Reliability meaning that you have less schedule on unscheduled interruption of your water, which is what all of us want. Um, I make no excuse for that. I am also part of it. We're all part of it. The moment we realize we open the Dower School tap and there's no water, the chip scene and the complaints and everything else, and Mr. James and Mr. Thomas, and not Mr. Thomas, sorry, Mr. Williams, and Mr. Etienne can attest to that, that I always give them the flag and tell them they have to be able to withstand the constant barrage and pressure because water is life. Water is essential. So do not give us any praises if 30 days pass and it's only one time we had the interruption. Half an inter interruption is already too many. So we understand that in, a, in an environment like that, reliability is the order of the day. So renewable energy will increase our reliability. And we've already started, Mr. Williams didn't tell you, I don't know why, that even in the new system we're doing, in our whole question of building back better, which we already started, in our model project at resettlement at Belleville Chopin, we have to ensure, we're ensuring that we take the water from an area of a lot of serious stream flow from the Pichelin Heights. But to get that water to Belleville Chopin, since Belleville Chopin is at a high elevation, we have to pump. We have to ensure that we gone into our pockets to get almost $300,000 to get a renewable energy system for that um, water supply. So we already started the process, and this is where we want to go to, to ensure that we, we have the, the level of requisite um, service quality in going forward in what we do. The other aspect that we really want to emphasize, since going forward we want to improve the reliability and quality of the service, we also have to look at the whole question of cost and quality of service. Um, with renewable energy, you will have a higher initial upfront cost, but the operating cost in the long run will be very minimal. And so it is in our best interest of Dow School to ensure that we go into renewable energy because the operating costs will be significantly lower as well. So there are very tangible benefits, as we can see from all sectors, and we're happy to see that we already started in that, in that area. I also want to put a note of caution, not because we have started that we're going to take any comfort from that, because we have realized that with the experience we have gained from Maria, that we really have to raise that bar maybe tenfold from where we are right now. And so the, the resources that will be required in terms of equipment, um, plant and machinery, and more importantly, the manpower aspect of it, because we're going to have to look now at a different type of engineering going at Dower School for going forward right now at Dower School. We have to look at more innovative, more creative, yet still that is hinged and pinned very seriously to technologically advanced solutions and systems. And so I am happy to say we are not in it alone and we are very fortunate and we are blessed to have the support of the global community um, without running the risk of leaving anybody else. I would say the World Bank, the PAHO, UNICEF, and all the other great persons and, and corporate citizens have been coming forward and ensuring that we have the requisite support and that. But at the end of the day, the, the focus and the emphasis has to start with us. It has to be driven from our school. It has to be driven from the ministry. And I can say without any further contradiction here that our school know that they won't be spared because at the highest level, it has been constant um, strain and constant pressure and it is necessary, and I say to them all the time, just do not allow the pressure to get to your head, just keep it chest level. But it is the reality that we have. We have a serious 
situation at hand, and we cannot spare any effort or I mean, in ensuring that we give our fullest attention to that. So, Mr. Thomas, I just wanted to reiterate some of the initiative and the commitment we have made so far in ensuring we improve the reliability and resi resilience of the system. Hi, good morning. Rhonda Luke from the Chronicle newspaper. Um, can any preliminary figures be given in terms of damages, how much the company has suffered post Maria, and in terms of building, building a resilient um, system, how much is the company expect to spend in terms of building resiliency? Yes, so um, a preliminary damage um, assessment was done, and um, the estimated cost to build back better with full resilience for the entire network um, has been preliminarily estimated to be in excess of $140 million for entire water and sewage network. Um, to date, we, we've spent um, probably in excess of $3 million, $3 million just on relief, relief activities so far. Um, but just to reiterate, we expect that to fully restore our systems with a high level of resilience, um, that the estimate is probably about uh, over $140 million. And that will be refined as we go forward and we do this, these studies, and we'll have a more, uh, I guess, accurate picture later on. Yeah, EC dollars? EC dollars, yes. Uh, Mrs. James? Yeah, you want to? Mr. Blackmore wants to add to that. The question that Ms. Luke asked is a very tricky one. Um, the reason why I say it's a tricky one because the situation is not static nor is it constant. Um, I, I know while and we, we had the preliminary rapid assessment, we, we had some very serious internal debate that we have to look at when we look at the damage effect and impact we also have to take into consideration the consequences and how we go forward in strategizing. Um, clearly, if we're talking about having almost like a leapfrog jump from where we are to where we're going to go, when you take into consideration the repair and replacement cost, the repair and replacement cost is going to be a subset or a combination of the damage plus the needs. Um, so what, Mr. what the, the chief engineer just gives you is more a part of the initial damage. But if we have to look at very seriously going forward, we cannot separate the two. So you look at basically part of the damage and the needs, because the needs is important, because the needs is part of the building back better. And the building back better, because you're going to have a higher standard, um, higher standard will mean better material, and better material also is sometimes equivalent with higher cost and everything else. So what we are looking in initially, and we're still on the thing, well, is an excess of $400,000, but that doesn't look at seriously at the reconstruction, because the reconstruction, as he said to you about, is going to take new forms, new approaches, new systems, and new considerations. And so <clears throat> I think maybe in the next couple of weeks, we will be able to have a more tangible figure as far as the reconstruction aspect is concerned, because we have to liaise a little more with our regional partners or international partners, because we really have to leave that, that bar right now. So it cannot be a come habitude, as they will say in French. It's a different dispensation. And as a result of that, the, the reality is going to be different. There's still a very string line that we have to look between affordability and, 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 and cost. But at the end of the day, the level of disruption um, is one that we have to put, put into, co in, into context. And we really want to ensure that to minimize the disruption that we'll have to have initial higher costs. So it's more in the region, Miss Look, for the time being, of in excess of $400,000. And the figure is expected to change because as we keep looking at the reconstruction aspect, the higher systems and we're looking in place will have greater implication for cost. Thank you all, the media present here at the briefing room of the Office of the Prime Minister. Thank you to all the speakers at the podium representing Duasco. 
starting with the head, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Housing, Lands and Water Resource Management, Mr. Lucian Blackmore, Ivanira James, the Operations and Maintenance Manager at Duasco, and Magnus Williams, the Chief Engineer at Duasco, the Dominica Water and Sewerage Company. Thank you one and all. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day and enjoy the weekend.